Texas to you all. Good morning. It is good to be with you today. Lent in peace to you and you who are online as well. If you're visiting today, uh, whether you're on campus or you're online, I remind you that you are welcome, that you are loved, and that God is well pleased. I start with a personal story this morning. A couple months ago, I was invited to a arts class at Hawaii Kai Retirement Community Center. Uh, and I just self-disclosure already, uh, not a good artist at all, okay? So I am not someone who <clears throat> knows how to draw very well. Um, I think I learned how to draw Garfield somewhere in grade school, and I, that's the only thing I know how to draw. I don't know his practice. And so I'm in this class, and the assignment is, well, first the instructor gives the basics about how to do some sketching, how to do some drawing. And so I'm there, and she teaches these basics, and then comes to each of the students and places something in front of them, and then the student is then supposed to draw what's in front of them, right? So I get this small Chinese face, and I begin to draw, and I begin to erase, and then I draw some more, and then I do some more erasing. And pretty soon I start realizing this is going to be very difficult. Now, you also have to understand something. Everyone else in the class seems to be excelling, seems to be amazing drawing people, right? Great artists. And so it makes me feel like I'm way out here, the non-artist guy, and everybody else is amazing. Then my instructor comes, and the instructor sends some really kind, and nice things about my drawing, and she encourages me, and then she takes my art and she says, well, what if we try this? And she turns it around and she begins to do a few things and works on my shading, my, my outlining of what I had just drawn, and all of a sudden I get back this drawing that looks not that bad, it actually looks pretty good. And I say, wow, you know, like here is this moment that I was feeling way out there, and now she has brought me back to the center. In fact, I have the drawing. I brought it with me because I'm sort of proud of it. Look at this. Can you see it? I don't know if you can see it. You see that shading? Yeah. You see that shading? <laughs> and so this is my Chinese vase, and then um, I, I titled it Anointing oil jar, and then we put this up at the White Kai, because some of our members there um, are in charge of this, so they put my art up. But I say this story to you this morning, because I believe today's wisdom speaks about those who are on the edges, how they are brought back to the center. Those who were considered not good artists, or somehow brought back to feel like they have some artistic ability. Today's wisdom comes from Luke's Gospel, and I do want to recognize something. The Revised Common Lectionary. Have you heard of this? It provides a three-year, uh, really systematic uh, series of readings that we do on Sunday mornings. It's what we've read today, and it's known as the Revised Common Lectionary. You may or may not be aware of this, but us clergy and pastor types, we are well aware that we are in the lectionary year C, which focuses on the Gospel of Luke. This Advent, later this year, we will move into lectionary year A, which focuses on the Gospel of Matthew. And then the following Advent, we will move into lectionary year B, which focuses on the Gospel of Mark and more selections from the Gospel of John. Now, I mentioned the lectionary this morning because we will be studying, we will be interpreting the Gospel of Luke from now till Thanksgiving of this year, and that's a long time. And perhaps you want to buy some books, you perhaps you want to study more the Gospel of Luke, understand who is the writer and what is being said there. But with this in mind, I want to establish a, maybe some motifs regarding the Gospel of Luke. 
there is a professor. His name is Joel B. Green. He's a New Testament scholar, a professor at the Fuller Seminary. That's my seminary. That's why I say it that way. And he believes, okay, that the first chapter of Luke, uh, Mary's song in that chapter, that it presents themes that are central to the development of Luke's gospel. Did you hear? Now, I know that um, I don't have time to share all of those motifs. I will only share with you one of the themes that I think pertains to today's wisdom. And perhaps, in my opinion, the most significant motif suggested in all of Mary's song is this. It is the portrayal of the coming of salvation as the great reversal. Let me explain it. The coming of Jesus, the coming of salvation, will be like the turning of things upside down. Just like there are expectations in our world today, there were surely expectations in antiquity, and those expectations were flipped and shattered by this great universe. Those who were excluded were now included. Those who were considered out by the society are now considered in in the kingdom of God. Those who were held at an arm's length, considered second-class citizens, on the fringes, people like the poor, children, women, widows, the sick, lepers, were brought into the center. Jesus leveled the ground. Those who were outsiders were now insiders in the kingdom of God. And the most notable, by the way, is perhaps Mary herself. Think about this. An unmarried, pregnant, teenage girl speaking and bearing witness to what God is doing to Jesus. Did you know that 40% of the people named in Luke's gospel are women? See, I believe this speaks profoundly to the role and the importance of women in the life and ministry of Jesus. And I wish I had time to go into that. But we have a whole temptation story to speak about this morning. And perhaps it is best understood through the lens of identity. From Adam to the people of Israel to Jesus, there is a lineage, there is a linkage, there is a family tree, shall we say, and therefore a God-given identity. Adam, made in the image of God, Israel, a chosen nation to be God's people, and Jesus, God said, you are my son, whom I dearly love, and in you I am well pleased. That revelation happened in his baptism. So with such a definitive, right, imprint of God's identity on Jesus, why would the devil still attempt to test Jesus? Not once, not twice, but three times. Perhaps the devil believed that just like Adam and Eve gave into their temptation, so would Jesus. The devil tried to cast doubt on Jesus. The, the evil one attempted to distort Jesus' identity and mission. He even used uh, scripture itself to persuade Jesus. If you remember, Adam and Eve's temptation in the garden was to eat from the tree, which they were not supposed to. Here as well, in this first test, Jesus is tempted by the devil to eat when he should not it was not time to break his fast. And yet the enemy attempted him, tempted him with bread. And you know that Adam and Eve, they gave in to their temptation. But in this instance, Jesus did not give in to the devil. But let me pause here. Because here is where I believe the wisdom comes into the room. Here is where we ask the Holy Trinity to open our eyes, our hearts, our minds, our souls this morning. Here is where we try to understand the Holy Scriptures and grow in our faith this Lenten season. You see, Jesus was able to withstand and resist the evil one not once, not twice, but three times. How did Jesus do such a thing? See, I believe that we too can withstand the devil. That we too can resist 
the devil's evil schemes and lies and temptations. I say this to you because I have experienced it firsthand. I have seen it firsthand. When we trust in God, and when we trust in God's image on our faces, we can withstand the evil one. We can resist the devil. You see, Jesus trusted God. Jesus trusted his identity in God. And this is such a critical thing in life today for many Christians. They just don't trust God. They, they don't trust that they are made in the image of God, that they carry God's likeness on their faces. But I also understand the lack of trust as well. You know, Adam and Eve already carried the image of God. Adam and Eve were already like God. Still, the evil one deceived them, confused them of their identity. They wanted to be more than they ought to be. See, I wonder, do we trust God? Do we trust God's image on our faces? Or do we trust other things? See, there are many Christians today, women, people of color, the LGBTQIA plus community, the poor and other oppressed communities who have put their trust in the opinions of humans. Accepting the low opinion that others have of us accepting the limited definitions of our roles in society, accepting the erasing of God's identity and image on our faces, not trusting God's definition of who we are. You see, Justo Gonzalez, who is a Cuban historian and theologian, he explains the third test from the devil in the following manner. He says, the devil seems to be saying I don't believe that you are the Son of God. In fact, I don't think you are too sure either. You see, church friends, those who are online today, beloved, we must carve into our hearts to understand that we are part of the great reversal, that we are part of an upside-down kingdom of God that was once excluded, but now we are included, that we were once considered out of the society, but now considered part of the society, once held at arm's length and considered second class on the fringes, but now brought into the center, in the kingdom of God, being excluded in rejection, and rejected is not a sign of God's curse, rather a sign of God's blessings. See, it's fascinating to me that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, is led into the wilderness. And perhaps you have an image uh, of the wilderness as this uh, beautiful place, friendly, that you walk and fight through. However, in Luke's time, the wilderness was considered a place of fear where beasts and the powers of darkness would come to dwell. And there, in that space, Jesus wins the battle against the devil. This should encourage us, this should give us hope that even in the wilderness, we are called to the riverside to be washed by grace. That even in the struggle, in the oppressive forces, even through hardship and grief, God's promises still spill over. That even in the middle of our doubts, fears, anxieties, and brokenness, God's assurances sour us. Because I think there's something that we need to accept this morning. There's a reality that wilderness and darkness will exist perpetually. Did you hear me? You see, sexism, violence, divisiveness, homophobia, racism, war, countries bombing countries, people politicizing death, innocent civilians taking arms, women and children becoming soldiers. It's not going anywhere. Scripture says that when the devil had finished testing Jesus, he departed from him until an opportune time 
Do you know what that means? That means that the devil is not going anywhere. The devil will return over and over again, has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Temptations will persist, and many will give in to those temptations. Not only those outside of the church, but even those inside of the church. The ills, the sins of the American Christian church will persist. I mean, I doubt that tomorrow the church will begin to live up to their ethics and call. I doubt that tomorrow the church will be fully inclusive. I, I doubt that tomorrow the church will be truly just. I doubt that tomorrow the church will confess their sins of consumerism, of divisiveness, of sexism, and racism. There are way too many things to live up to. But we cast aside the devilish temptations to fall into despair and misery. Instead, I wonder, what if, what if existing in this space with this tension is right where we need to be today? Recognizing that the malevolent, hateful things of this world are under the authority of a benevolent Trinitarian God. Did you hear me? I'll say that again. Recognizing that the malevolent things of this world are under the authority of a benevolent Trinitarian God. This is to say, there is an infinite love, a cosmic hope, a Trinitarian flow, shall we say, that is putting everything back together, healing the entire world. All creation is being made new. And perhaps the most beautiful thing of this all is that you and I are invited into that healing flow. Jesus defeated the evil one once and for all, by the way, at the cross. His glory manifested through his death on a cross, taking away our failures, mistakes, transgressions, our doubts, and giving us his successes, his forgiveness, his righteousness, and his identity. And he resurrected three days later to give us liberation. Liberation for what? See, I believe it's liberation to trust that our Trinitarian God is healing all of us. But despite what we see on the news, God is healing in all. That despite what we are bombarded with in our phones and in any other social media platform, we are reminded that our Trinitarian God is healing all of us. And to trust that God's image on our faces, that God's image on our faces is this place, and love you and for heaven can be placed to be part of the food process. You see, God brings us into this process. God brings us into this process. Thank you.